Welcome to the Daily Bolster. Each day we welcome transformational executives to share their real-world experiences and practical advice about scaling yourself, your team, and your business. Welcome to the Daily Bolster. I'm Matt Blumberg, co-founder and CEO of Bolster. And I'm here today with my friend Christian Anderson. Uh, Christian is a partner at High Alpha, a B2B SaaS venture studio and seed investor, uh, and someone I've known for about uh, 10 years. Uh, Christian, good to see you. Thank you for being here. Good to see you. We go way back, Matt. We do. And that's perhaps where we should start our conversation today. So when I met you, you were running Studio Science, um, which uh, was an agency that I think you started. Um, and uh, we hit it off. Uh, we brought you into Return Path to revamp everything. Um, and uh, so let's start there. What? Uh, how long was your run at Studio Science from starting it until you left to start High Alpha? Uh, and what got you there? And what was like a little bit about that part of your journey? Yeah, sure. Um, can I do one quick aside, Matt? Sure. I just, I, I, you. You've been in a room when I've told this story, and I know you always cringe a little bit, but I love telling the story, and I want your I want your audience to hear it. So I I didn't know Matt, but we had gotten connected through uh, a, a business partner of Matt's and a and a, a client of mine, and uh, the the team flew to New York, and we had a great set of interactions with Matt's team. And at the end of the day, I had not met Matt yet, and Matt walks into the conference room in uh, like shorts and flip-flops and a Hawaiian shirt. And I'm like, okay, this is like the, this is the I'm real cringing question. already. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to ask some tough question to knock us off our game. And he sits down and, you know, he's a delightful guy, has a smile on his face. And uh, he goes, well, the team said they had a great set of interactions with you. We, you know, really kind of admire the work you've done historically. I've really just got one question for you. Um, before we consummate this. And he said, um, what's one thing we can do uh, to be the best possible client for you? And I was stunned. Uh, no one had ever asked me that question. I was not, I could have answered a thousand other questions, but it took me a couple of minutes to get my footing. I was just so blown away. And our team came back to the office and we shared that story. It became like part of the lore of how we think about how do we how how can we be great customers and great clients to the people that that we work with. And Matt, um, be an exaggeration to say not a day goes by that I don't think about that. But I think about that an awful lot. And the the affection it engendered on the part of our team and the way we hustled and worked for Return Path with uh, as a result of that one really simple question. So thanks for indulging me. I just wanted to share that. And thanks for making me cringe again. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, look, I, I, you know, I, I fundamentally believe when it comes to agencies, although it's not just agencies, you know, when it comes to any any business partnership, but I think right. it's very true with with agencies that um, it's it's about the partnership and about the relationship, and it's not about throwing things over the wall to a vendor and hoping it works. So, yeah. Uh, it was anyway. It was really yeah. cool. Right, well, I'll tell you. I'll, All right. So I'll, let's so, yeah. so let's talk about studio science. Let's spin through my story. Okay. So, um, I grew up in a very rural part of the country in uh, North Central Arkansas, and from the time I was really a little kid, I had a pretty clear vision of what I wanted to do for a living. And when I say a little kid, I mean seven, eight, nine years old. I, I knew that I was interested in design. I wanted to be a designer. Um, you know, way back then they called it like, uh, they called it commercial art. Can you believe that? So like kind like of the graphic blue, design or commercial graphic design, commercial art. And I was the kid that for like Christmas, I asked for drafting tables and airbrushes and T-squares instead of transformers and GI Joe. And, and my dad, who was a creative himself, ran a very successful architectural and interior design firm out of New York, indulged that. And um, we, we did not have a lot. My dad and I did not have a lot in common. I, I loved sports and the outdoors. And, and, um, and he was more into piano and architecture. But there was one area where we had a, a mutual love affair. And it was with the aesthetic and the ability that we could uh, kind of inform our environment and our context. And we could, we could make wholly new things with d design as, as kind of the impetus for that. And so I grew up 
oddly enough, kind of always knowing what I wanted to do and uh, had, a, had a pretty strong entrepreneurial bent as a kid, you know, never, never had a real job, but was always making more money than my friends that did and uh, ended up in school and studied, studied design. Uh, right out of school, I took a job with uh, this. This will show you how old I am in 1997 um, with one of the very earliest uh, kind of incarnations of an Internet company. Uh, it, it, it was a terrible idea. They were building Internet connected kiosks installed in gas stations where you could it was basically very early e-commerce. So you could you could buy things at these kiosks in the mid 90s. And it turns out that when people are buying Slim Jims and Moon Pies, they're typically not in the market to buy a $400 phone from the Sharper Image. So the, the business, that business did not flourish. And I and then six months later, I found myself out of a job. Um, but my employer at the time, kind of as severance, um, gave me the graphics workstation I was working on and um, was really handy in making some early referrals. And uh, I ended up hanging out my own shingle as a 21-year-old. And I was fortunate enough that right around the time I, I started that business, there were a number of companies based in Indianapolis, which is where I was making my home at the time, that, that were starting that turned out to become really big businesses. And, and, and you know many, if not all of them, but uh, a Primo and Angie's List and Exact Target, and, and they all became customers. And I was fortunate enough to be able to grow Studio Science in lockstep with um, with those companies. So I was, uh, you know, in the land of the blind, the man with one eye leads. So this was the time when if you were a designer with any kind of technical fluency at all, there was a lot of opportunity for you. And, and we were doing everything, right? We were building websites and configuring email servers and hosting those websites on cruddy little workstations shoved underneath our desk. And, uh, and got just a remarkable education on the intersection of, of technology and design. Um, as that company grew uh, through the, the largesse and generosity and success of our, of our customers, um, we did something really interesting, Matt. We, we started taking equity positions, and we're talking like, you know, late 90s, early 2000s here, we started taking equity positions on our customers in lieu of kind of full compensation. And that really gave me a backdoor education on the world of kind of early stage startup finance, um, which led to me becoming a rather prolific angel investor. And around the mid 2000s, my now partner, Mike Fitzgerald at, at High Alpha, he and I launched a very ragtag venture fund that was most our LPs were our friends and uh, called Gravity Ventures. And we subsequently raised six, six funds. And we kind of ran that out of the, out of studio science, out of the studio. I did, I did not know that. That's really interesting. Yeah. And they were like, they performed extraordinarily well, kind of going back to, you know, there, there's a there's we have a saying in Arkansas, which is if the wind's blowing hard enough, even turkeys can fly. And so this was a period of time where there there was a dearth of capital in the Midwest. Um, we were fortunate enough to raise some, and and we got a reputation for writing hundred thousand dollar checks two weeks after meeting a founder. And so a couple of years in, we're getting fifteen hundred two thousand pitches a year, kind of coming through the transom and. And we're, we're able to capitalize on that. So, er, so early on, I'm kind of learning how to run a services business. Um, I have a very crude understanding of the economics of venture. Um, and at some point, I'm looking around going, do I want to be selling brains by the pound for the rest of my life? And, you know, at Studio Science, we had MBAs and strategy people and designers and engineers and and we began, we made the decision to start starting companies. And uh, we, uh, we launched a handful of endeavors out of, out of the, uh, the studio, which, you know, became real companies. Um, you know, one of those, you've had Max Yoder uh, on this, on this um, podcast. And uh, Max was one of, you know, our early partners in doing that with what ultimately became what ultimately became Lessonly. So to, to me, that, that kind of 15 year period of, 
consulting and designing and uh, investing and then moving into that co-founder role is really what I think prepared me for for what I'm doing now. Yeah, I uh, it's it's funny. I'm not sure I knew. I definitely didn't know about the venture fund, and I'm not sure I knew about the um, about business incubation either. So that so that's the bridge. That totally makes sense. There you go. Um, before we get into High Alpha and what High Alpha is, so you started Studio Science. You didn't take venture investment. No. Uh, and so presumably you owned it or owned most of it. Yeah, I owned owned a hundred percent of it. We did do something again, nothing novel today, but fifteen years ago was quite novel, which was we did create a uh, a separate entity that held the equity in the companies that we invested in, right, um, and shared that ratably with our staff. So our entire yeah. team of you know forty five fifty folks were able to participate in what looked a lot like carried interest yeah. in the work we were doing at Studio Science. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's uh, um, you know, the, the employee-centric leader in me loves that, obviously. Um, so when you decided to uh, leave and start uh, High Alpha, um, how did you think about, about what to do with Studio Science? So if my, if my understanding is right, you have hired a new leader and management team, presumably you still own it or own a bunch of it. No. So I'll tell you the story. So um, in, uh, in, in around 2014, 2015, I started getting inbound from uh, investment groups, uh, pri private equity uh, in, in particular. And if you had told me 10 years prior that there was ever going to be a market for a Midwestern design focused studio, uh, you know, for an economic buyer, uh, I would have I would have looked at you like you had two heads. But we live in a very strange world, Matt. And so around 2015, I started getting some inbound uh, interest in in acquiring the company, which I had never conceived of. It was a fast growing, profitable, super fun business, and I imagined I would do that for the rest of my life. But, you know, as you know, when you allow yourself to think about that alternative, it really can kind of open the aperture around, you know, what's possible. And I ended up getting very close to the finish line with one group. And I had, I had seen enough M&A transactions through my lens as investor to know that if they tell you it's going to be done in three months and you're still talking about it nine months later, that's not a good sign. And I ended up hiring a really talented uh, executive named Steve Pruden out of a company called Aperio, which was a very large cloud consulting company based in Indy, to take over as CEO. And I said, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to either get this business sold to this particular buyer and, and, and I incentivized him to do so, but I incentivized him even more um, to not sell it to that buyer. Meaning if you can get a deal done quickly, it'll be great for you. It'll be great, great for us. If you can't, I'd like you to run it, like run through the tape. And, um, and uh, he, he got excited about that and joined the company as CEO. I took a very big step back. And about six months into that, he came back to me and he said, listen, I know exactly what you want because I've been running this process on your behalf. And he said, I've got a group of investors that want to give it to you and we, we want to buy the company from you. And uh, so Steve and I worked out the details of that. And uh, I do maintain a small uh, equity position in the business, but for the most part, I, I sold the vast majority of it to this group and they've they've done remarkable things with it. Um, it's, it's really, it's really flourished under, under Steve's leadership. And, and as, you know, so as that transaction was being consummated, Matt, around the same period of time as when my partner, Scott and Mike and Eric, who were all at Salesforce by way of the exact target acquisition, were beginning to think about what's next for them. And we had, we had been longtime friends and collaborators had, invested in each other's businesses, worked for each right. other's businesses. And, uh, and we knew we wanted to do, we wanted to do something together. Um, yeah. So let me, before we jump to high alpha, uh, let me just ask one, one follow-up on studio science, because that's, that's really interesting. So 
you've maintained uh, some equity position. I don't know if you're on the board, but you still you're still in touch with Steve, I think. Sure, sure. Um, what have what have you learned in the eight years since you stopped being CEO um, by watching someone else run your company? It probably doesn't feel like your company anymore. Maybe, maybe it no, doesn't. It's but it had to the first couple of years. Um, was there was there something you learned or some aha that you had about either the business or like your own leadership profile from watching someone else kind of take the keys to the car? Hmm. Yeah, I, sure. I, the, the business has changed pretty pretty significantly. Um, what what Steve has done, and he, he'd do a better job of articulating this than I would, but we were a like design first consulting business. So what that means is the 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 inmates were kind of running the asylum, right? So it was mostly designers on the leadership team. I was a designer and designers have this weird kind of peccadillo, which is the most important thing for them is doing great design work. That sometimes means that other very important aspects of running a successful business um, get subjugated, right? Take net margins, right? I was going to say um, finance, finance is the word that comes to mind. Right? Yeah. And, and I would say I was, um, I, I had a, a, a strong grasp of how to run a successful, profitable services business. But if it was ever a jump ball between doing work we wanted to do um, and sacrifice margin versus maybe doing work that we weren't as enthusiastic about that would maybe be a lot more profitable for the business. There's no question. We're like, we're going to do, we're going to do the fun, gratifying thing because we had this kind of missional creative bent in what we we do. And so there, I, I did not run the business in a dispassionate way for lack of a better word. And, and the good news is that it worked out. I mean, I, I, I loved running that business the business was, in fact, quite profitable and and, and launched a, a lot. Maybe what I'm most proud of is launched a lot of careers um, and, and people that went on to do much bigger and better things. When Steve took over, he's not a designer. Um, you know, he's a cloud platform consulting executive, right? And he's got an engineer's mind. He's he's a professional race car driver as well. And uh, and he he tends to think about the physics of business differently than than I did. And and he realized there were a lot of opportunities that we had been saying no to. That if you could feather in that really strong, excellent design aesthetic to some of these, um, maybe what what would have appeared to me at the time as as like less interesting opportunities. You could build something really, really fantastic. So they they really pivoted the business. It's still a design first company, but they are basically the marriage of a design firm and a systems integration firm now. So they built partnerships in in particular with Salesforce, um, and for Salesforce implementations for which design is an important component, they're becoming really kind of a preferred vendor for that. So they're. There, and that's, it's so obvious. Like, I don't know why I didn't see that. I don't know why I didn't pursue that. But but Steve and the team has, and he's he's brought a lot, he's a very consensus-driven leader. He's built a remarkable board um, and, and, and really feathers their input into, into the direction of the business in a way that I never did. I, frankly, I enjoyed being the boss. I enjoyed making the decisions, whether they were right or wrong. And when I think about some of the things that might have retarded the progress of the business, um, it's probably that I did not seek out uh, plurality of opinions as aggressively as as I should have. And Steve does a remarkable job of that. That's, uh, yeah, that's great. I mean, look, the, the, um, uh, there's someone, and I'm drawing a blank at the moment, who I have also interviewed for the Daily Bolster, who has a, a routine, um, oh, it's Steve Sloan from Contentful, hmm. uh, has a routine uh, called uh, something like fire yourself. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he sort of, he, 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 he has uh, a practice of saying, all right, if I'm not doing my job and someone else is coming in to do my job, what are they going to find and what are they going to do? <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
uh, I think it's true that like different talented people will have a different take on the yeah. same thing or a slightly different take on the same thing. So sometimes it's not even a thing. Sometimes you're just a slave to momentum. I mean, I, I, I kind of uh, uh, along the lines of the, the quote you just shared, um, a therapist asked me once, if you were taking over your life right now, what would you do differently? Right. And that's a really interesting question because that's not somebody else taking over with a different set of experiences and expertise. That's like you. And that question really forces you to think about like, what am I doing today purely as a function of inertia and momentum? And uh, yeah, I think it's it's an important question to ask. And one, frankly, that I probably don't ask myself a not, uh, enough, e even as I sit here in 2023. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about High Alpha. Um, you uh, are now one of the four partners who runs, um, uh, I would say, a leading venture studio. Uh, mm -hmm. You all are in the business of creating uh, and co-creating companies as well as funding companies. Um, are you having fun? Is it as fun as it sounds? Uh, <laughs> or at some point, is, the, is there like a process you're following like every other job and it becomes a little bit of a grind? Well, there's plenty of grind to it, but, um, you know, again, at the risk of sounding cliche, like anything like worth doing excellently, there are going to be periods that it's just, it's more work than fun. With that being said, um, you know, I told you as a little kid, I wanted to be a designer. If, if I had had a more expansive vocabulary as a nine-year-old, yeah. I probably would have described my dream job as something shockingly similar to what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my partners and I, we, we, all, we all have different kinds of skills uh, and, and to some extent, maybe even different interests, but the stuff that, ma the stuff that matters, there's like tremendous amount of overlap. Right. And we, we love we love startups, but I think more importantly, we love the people who start startups. So we have a very relational kind of orientation at High Alpha. And when I think of like the intersection of great design, finance, operating, and loving on people, like this is a, this is a dream job. Because when you're starting companies with co-founders, you, you are getting a front row seat to... Uh, the toughest, hardest, most challenging span of time in many people's lives. I mean, it is, it's hard. Um, I, I uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a quote from Shackleton, the great Antarctic explorer, um, who says, um, by endurance, we conquer. And the, the building of a startup is an exercise in endurance. I heard, I heard another I wish I could think of who said this. I heard an, uh, another quote recently that was, excellence is your ability to withstand pain. So th this, th it is a, you, Matt, you know this, you're like in the middle of it right now. You know, it is, it is hard. It is painful, um, but it's, it's, it's worth it. And, and if done rightly, like if you're, if you're healthy, like an emotionally, cognitively healthy person, you understand that pain for what it is, right? Which is, a, it's a stimulant to growth. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think, you know, you might catch me on a Wednesday afternoon at 2.30 and I might tell you something different, but my general orientation is we kind of, we kind of embrace this hard work because, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we, we embrace that work and, and that pain um, because that's really the only way you build something that's exceptional. There's no one's ever built anything exceptional that wasn't extraordinarily hard. I, I of, of all the things I've started in my life, the ones that have been successful, there was never a point where at some point I didn't roll over to my wife on the verge of tears and say, why did I, why did I start this? Like there's some point where you feel like you're going to break and that I don't always recognize it in the moment, but in hindsight, I look back at those moments and I'm like, ah, we're on to something now. Um, how do you how do you balance in the studio? I mean, you guys create, uh, co-create half a dozen companies a year, maybe more, right? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, five or six a year. Yeah. So how do you balance um, needing to have 
sort of consistency and discipline of of process and you're you know you're focused on b2b saas so it's sort of one kind of thing and and a, a repetitive motion how do you balance that with the need to be extraordinarily creative uh and know every company actually is different yeah yeah how, how does that how does that dynamic work for the well, studio or how does it work for you as as a, you know a design professional or former design professional yeah yeah i i think there's uh probably two for us everyone else's mileage may differ for us there are, i think maybe two things come to mind the first one is um engineering very specific rhythms into your work week that um are uh, are are like designed for you to engage in generative creative um you know curiosity indulging activities and and then having some more like particular structure around the road process oriented things that have just got to get done um and it i would argue it is it's actually the biggest challenge in our model it's not an insurmountable challenge but it's one that requires like a a lot of intentionality on our part so you know for me for example um i don't my 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 whole week is kind of meetings but i don't do any meetings until 11 a.m. hard stop so I have this three or four hour block every day where I'm not sitting in somebody else's meeting, where I'm not working on somebody else's problem necessarily, um, where my mind, for lack of a better word, is allowed to go places that it wouldn't normally be allowed to go if I was if I if my if the first staff meeting was at 7 a.m. and you were running through the tape until 7 p.m. So engineering. Rhythms. So you just described my day today. <laughs> it's perfect. I mean, but it's it's. I think it's really important, and people are different. So different things work for different people. But but for me, my partner Mike says, um, unstructured time leads to exponential productivity. So baking in some unstructured time every day, and and really um, protecting that like religiously is important because the world. Is trying to infect that time with its own with its own agenda, right? So that's one. So engineering kind of the appropriate rhythms. The other one is like the the composition of the team. So we both at the partner level, the leadership team level, and the IC level. <clears throat> excuse me. We we have people that are um, both know and are oriented towards certain types of work patterns. We have people that are incredibly process driven. We have people that are incredibly generative and creative. And by the way, those are not obviously necessarily, you know, mutually exclusive, but we're very good about knowing where our power alleys are, where our power lanes are and deploying the right resource in, into those things. But we, I would say, I don't know if it's every six months or every 12 months, but on a pretty regular basis, we have to step back and say, is the process um, overtaking like the purpose? Mm. And, 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 and sometimes we have to do the we have to do the opposite, which is we're really executing purposefully, um, but we're suffering or moving slower than we could or delivering work that's not as high quality because we don't have the right structure and process in place. And Anyone who tells you they've nailed that and two two years later they're operating the same way, it's just not telling you the truth. So it requires a constant kind of recursive revisiting, load balancing between the the kind of uh, structured process and the more free form creativity. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. All right, last topic. Okay. Indianapolis. Mm. Uh, I. Uh, tell people all the time about Bolster, about Richard Path. And, uh, you know, we have a big presence uh, in, uh, or a big part of the company. I wouldn't say a big presence in Indianapolis, but a big part of the company. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and that goes back to, to Return Path as well. And, you know, nine out of 10 people give me a, give me a look like, you where, what? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've loved having a presence in a team in India. It's a great, great market. Um, 
Uh, but you and your partners at High Alpha have had a really interesting, interesting sort of um, window into the evolution of um, of the the city, um, and quite frankly, have had a lot of impact on it between um, Exact Target and uh, and now High Alpha. <laughs> and uh, you know, I love the work that Brad Feld, our mutual friend, has done around startup communities and sort of documenting the Boulder thesis and. Um, so I'm just wondering, as someone who's kind of been on the ground floor of that for a smaller city in the U.S., yeah. um, of really helping build a tech ecosystem there um, and and a real startup community there, um, had, had reflect on that for for our last couple of minutes together. Sure. What has that been like? Sure, and I would encourage whoever's listening to this, don't turn it off yet. I know that like, you know, asking someone to champion their kind of mid-market, Midwestern city is the last question. You might be like, okay, I think I got everything out of this discussion I'm going to need. Stick around because this is um, this is one of my favorite topics. I, you know, I I was I, I think you know this, Matt. I was born in New York, but but grew up in Arkansas and, and went to college in Indiana. I knew no one here. I had no friends, no family, um, and and really, in many ways, it's it, that was like the, you know, going to college in this state was like the second like epoch of my life, and it was really important for me, like at least in hindsight, because it was a, it was a place where I had um, no like structural advantage or disadvantage, right? I just showed up kind of unfettered. And my affection for this city in particular is very strong. I mean, Matt, I think you know this, but I have six children, uh, five daughters and one son, and I, and I named them Indy. Um, so that, that's one, one of my many love letters to this community. I was I was interviewed uh, a, a few months ago, and the uh, one of the questions was, "Why do you love?" The, the interviewer said, "Why do you love Indianapolis?" And I said, "Because Indianapolis loved me first. And I've always been struck by kind of just the meritocratic nature of this community. It's it's not wholly unique in that regard, but I think it is somewhat unique in that people don't really uh, care what your last name." is or where you went to college, though not that those things can't be important in certain contexts, but they're not particularly important here. And one of the things people, you know, because you look at other kind of uh, rust belt cities, Cleveland, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Indianapolis has um, really outperformed them economically. Uh, if it, it, Indianapolis looks more like a sunbelt city economically than, than it does its geographic contemporaries. And I'll tell you, one of the reasons I think that's so is that Indianapolis used to be called Indiana No Place. It was just so undifferentiated. Nobody nobody thought poorly of it. They just didn't think anything of it, right? And as I'm sure you've heard, the opposite of uh, love is not hate, it's indifference, right? So if people are indifferent about your community, that's like, that's really a bad, that's really a bad thing. And the very thing that made Indiana, Indiana, or Indianapolis, Indiana, no place, I think is what drove its success over the last 20 years, which was, you look at Detroit, it's got a very strong identity. It's based in the automotive industry, um, you know, at Motown and cars, right? And uh, if, if you look at the efforts to kind of kickstart the economy in, uh, in, in Detroit, and the same thing can be true of, of you know, I'll, I'll pick on Cincinnati or St. Louis as well. All the kind of new efforts are rooted in its history, right? So if you look at the Techstars Detroit, it's focused on mobility, right? Um, because Indianapolis didn't have that, in a way, it was a tabula rasa. And I think for for many, I think for many cities, I mean, Silicon Valley was the same way. If you, I mean, pre nineteen sixty, there was just almond orchards, right? So it was a blank slate. And I think it was that blank slate that allowed the city to adapt more quickly to the future, quite frankly, than than many of its contemporaries. And that's something that hasn't been studied. That's my own uh, thesis, but. You know, if you're trying to start a startup in Cincinnati, um, it's going to be consumer packaged goods, and you got to get PNG as your first customer. We don't really have that here. I mean, yes, we have big Fortune 500s, but they're diffuse, they're diverse, 
And so you don't get wed, you don't get anchored to the kind of economic past. And I think that that was one of the secrets. I think the other is there is, a, I, I, I do think geographies, that the culture of certain geographies um, are rooted in like uh, like a form of DNA, right? It is it is a true fact that people in the Midwest in general, in Indianapolis in particular, are pretty nice folks, right? They're they're uh, not the, cynical. The Midwest nice comes from somewhere. Yeah, they're they're nice. I, I think they have an orientation toward optimism. They they oftentimes lack an orientation toward ambition. So you've got a uh, nice, not cynical, optimistic. But but maybe not always the requisite level of ambition, and you might contrast that with other big cities in America that maybe are known as less nice places, but but have like really powerful mo am, you know ambitious motors. A funny thing happened in Indianapolis, and I you know you got to give Scott Dorsey and Exact Target so much credit for this, which is they built a breakout a breakout business, right? We could we could debate how that came to pass, but the reality is it came to pass. And a funny thing about ambition is um, it's contagious. Ambition is contagious. So we had this flower of ambition blossoming in this, uh, it's a small city, but it's not that small, right? It's a million and a half people. So it's operating at scale. And oftentimes the illustration I often use is, and I'll wrap this up, I promise. But the, the illustration I often use is, um, kind of geographic opportunity is is typically a function of the overlap between opportunity and access. So if you think about the Bay Area, all the opportunity in the world, boatloads of capital, talent, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's teeming with opportunity, which is why young, ambitious, bright people historically have migrated to that to that area. And the same is true for New York and to a lesser degree, maybe Dallas, Texas, and, and, and or Houston, something like that. But then you, so think of that opportunity as one big circle of opportunity in the Bay Area. And then you've got the access orb. And if you think of that as a Venn diagram, your ability to access that talent, city leadership, state leadership, capital, it can actually be quite constrained because of the competition for it. Mm -hmm. Conversely, you could look at Topeka, Kansas. The access orb is enormous. I could have lunch with the mayor every Tuesday if I wanted to, right? But the opportunity that resides there is fairly de minimis. There are a few cities in America, Indy being one of them, where the access orb and the opportunity orb are similarly sized, quite large and profound, you know, profoundly overlapping. And so when, when people talk about like next great cities, that's what I'm always looking for. I'm looking for a city that's operating at scale, where there's lots of opportunity, and the lay person, meaning the unconnected person from Arkansas, ability to tap into that is, is significant. And I think all those constituent elements are uh, uh, reside here in the city. So come on. If you haven't been, if you want to visit, our door is always open. That's, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's just a, gr a great way of framing um of framing the whole topic, uh, access and opportunity. Um, Kristen, we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not getting all that right. We have some work to do uh, around the edges yeah. for, for sure. But, but I, there's, there's only a handful of cities, I think, that are operating at that intersection at the, at the same level as India. That's right. All right. Uh, great to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. And uh, we'll talk soon. My pleasure. Thanks, Matt.